All right. Sweet, sweet. See, like, sorry for all those technical difficulties uh, that threw me off a little bit, but I'll definitely find my footing back. But uh, thank you, everyone, for joining this. Super excited to be talking about this. I will preface this by saying that I am by no means a Linux expert. Last year, I spent some time working on our uh, workload security team at Dog, and I learned a lot of things about Linux. I uh, started reading a lot of books, doing a lot of labs, and just really diving deep into Linux. And one of the areas of uh, research that I spent some time in was research in various ways by which attackers could exfiltrate data from Linux workloads and containers as well. So I decided, you know, when and I were having this conversation, I was like, you know what, let me actually, you know, actually do something on this, right? I think it's pretty interesting. And there's not really much out there about, you know, exfiltrating data from Linux workloads because it's like, what is it, what it really is there to exfiltrate? Like, what, 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 what would they try to steal? What is valuable to steal? So I was like, you know what? I will bring some light to that. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so who am I? By the way, if you're not familiar with the who am I command, it's kind of just like lets you know who you are on the Linux system, but yeah. I am a security engineer at Datadog, where I focus specifically on cloud threat detection. So detection for AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, essentially researching different attack techniques that attackers are using in the wild to compromise environments and build in detections, ways by which you can actually catch these attackers right on their track, right? So, and surface these detections to our customers. Uh, like Gwen also said, I just recently graduated with my bachelor's in IT from WGU. I'm also a cybersecurity content creator on YouTube, uh, Day Cyberwalks with about 20,000 subscribers. I'm also the founder and community manager for Cyberworks Academy, which is just essentially an online community for uh, people who are looking to get cybersecurity. I recently also got into, I guess, let me say, I, I dabble in uh, create uh, cloud security content engineering and lab development. So essentially building like scenarios to help people learn cloud security. And also an AWS community builder. And also like Glenn mentioned, I, I'm a cybersecurity tutor at a local community college. So uh, brief intro by myself there. We, we got to get Microsoft MVP on that list. <laughs> hey, I hope so. That would be great. That would be great. That would be great, we, actually. We can talk about that later. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. All right, so the agenda for today is I'm going to be giving you a crash course on how to steal data. That's basically, if you're not familiar with what the world exfiltration is, basically just stealing data. And we'll go more into that later. You know, hide your kids. Probably don't want them to see this because I'm going to be teaching you how to steal data. So we're going to start with what data exfiltration is to steal, how to steal, how to catch a thief, and then go over some conclusions. All right, so has anyone ever had anything stolen from them before? You can leave a comment below and just, you know, tell us about your experience of someone stealing something from you, whether it was like when you were wearing in school, someone stole your pencil. I'm pretty sure you know how that feeling is, right? And this applies very much so to data exfiltration in terms of cybersecurity and cloud security and Linux workloads, right? So in basic technical terms, data exfiltration is the unauthorized transfer of sensitive data from a secure environment. And as you can see here, I underlined three key phrases, which is unauthorized transfer, sensitive data, and secure system. Unauthorized transfer means whoever is transferring that data should not be doing that. They should not probably have the access or permissions to be doing that. Sensitive data refers to whatever is in the environment that you don't want other people to have access to. This is like credentials, you know, passwords, or things that are like trade secrets, whatever the case is, that sensitive data that's specific to your company or whatever you're doing on your Linux workload. In secure environment, that's, you know, an environment that belongs to you that you have certain like network defense parameters around that you don't want people have to have access to. You don't want bad actors or hackers or attackers to get access to, right? So those three things are the different violations that data exfiltration uh, violates, right? Essentially, someone is taking data that belongs to you, that is precious to you, and removing it from your environment for whatever reason. And that's just essentially, in very layman terms, what data exfiltration is. And this presentation is going to be very, very, very basic and simple. Like, it's going to be very understandable. Now that you understand what data exfiltration is, you might be wondering, like, so what is, imp what is valuable to steal from a Linux workload, right? Like, what is worth stealing from your Linux workload? That's probably when you think about your Linux workload, you're like, oh, probably just use it for my virtual machine stuff. You know, I don't really do much there. I don't store like any code on there, like code is stored on GitHub or whatever. So like, why would someone want to steal something from my Linux workload? The truth is your Linux workload is a treasure trove, right? There are a ton of things on there that you don't realize are on there that are very, very, very valuable to an attacker. And if they can access to those things, well, they could further compromise your environment or use those things for various nefarious activity. That's what is valuable on your Linux work. Now, the very first thing that is extremely valuable is your bash command history. So like I said, you might not be storing like any code or anything on your, you know, Linux workload, but command history tells a lot about what you're doing on your Linux workload, right? It might be like passing in like, you know, credentials you're using for authentication, like API tokens, or like even putting your passwords in clear text, right? Or maybe making some system configurations, network configurations. Like you're doing a ton of things with bash and everything is being stored 
in your batch history file. So if an attacker is able to get access to this file and steal all of that data, you have a really, 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 really good understanding of what's going on in your environment, basically just from seeing what you're doing in your Linux work, right? So that's why this is, you know, very, very valuable to them. Dude, I'm not going to lie. I was going to, I was thinking to myself, like, I have, I probably have an idea. I'm not going to be surprised with like what, what like the possibilities are. Yeah. And then this is the first slide and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it's, I, I, I didn't even think about like, like all this. Yeah, because you know, essentially the way you interact with, I don't know, additional servers, even if you're using like a jump box, yeah, you're using that to SSH into other machines. Mm -hmm, a lot mm -hmm. of times people are using public IPs instead of private IPs, and, and yeah, all that is gonna be, you know, you just click up, up, up on your keyboard. And the <laughs> there. It's like, yeah, it's there. <laughs> it's there. yeah, that's why you, that's why you're able to like click up, up, up because it's stored somewhere. Yeah, right? it's like it's such a part of like how you interact with. Mm -hmm. like, you don't even think about, oh, this could be potentially like a security issue yeah that's you know one of the first things next thing is your git logs now as you can see here this is a record of an interaction that when it had like last year with uh, my commits to the learn to cloud repo, by the way, if you're not checking out learn to cloud, definitely go check it out. But this is where I've made a commit security section of, uh, of learn to cloud. Um, and as you can see here, uh, Linux actually stores uh, logs of that interaction. So the configuration, like my, my commits, right? It, it stores a, a checksum or what I did. And if an attacker is able to like get access to that, we can essentially do a git checkout and see like what, I, what, what my commit was, you know, whatever I might've committed, I might've committed access keys by mistake and you know they can get access to that so you know all of these things are stored and you know you could have committed credentials there you could have maybe like code vulnerabilities you might be fixing uh commands you might be running commits you might be making the most important thing is typically like the commits and if an attacker is able to get access to that steal that for that data like essentially you know kind of understand what's going on beyond just like on your host but what's happening in like your code repositories as well that's pretty dangerous when mentioned this earlier on she said uh, something around ssh keys but yeah like you know when you're connecting to other instances within your environment right you're probably using ssh right so if an attacker is able to exfiltrate ssh keys for one they could gain authorized access to other hosts within your environment they could maintain persistence within your the current environment that, that the current linux workload that they've compromised they could access other hosts within the uh, network they can know what other hosts are within the network so if you look into your ssh known host it stores log of like different uh, hosts you might have accessed within your environment and so that lets the attacker know okay there's like this diff these different hosts that continuously being accessed over and over again and gives them information about this now at surface level it's like this specific thing it's like oh the attacker can use it for something but in the first place if they can actually steal that data that's when they can actually use it so key thing i'm focusing on here is not what they're using it for but it's the fact that they, if they're able to steal it which is what we're focusing on they can then use it for those particular purposes and here is the kicker right so there's something that you have on um, Azure virtual machines. It's called the Azure Instance Metadata Service. It's also present on uh, AWS EC2 instance as well as Google Cloud Compute Engine. But essentially what the metadata service does, it essentially tells you data about your instance, right? So it's metadata. It basically gives you information about your instance, but also the underlying infrastructure that that instance is running from, right? And you could have your, your latest virtual machine running in Azure. Now, the amount of sensitive information that this metadata can contain is a lot. If an attacker is able to gather or extricate this Data, they can kind of have an understanding of what your environment looks like and that you know stems from like your, your placement group so that could be like context into other you know virtual machines or computer resources that might exist within your physical location next thing could be like your encryption keys so basically if you have like it could give context around encryption keys for your vm that you know use azure disk encryption for encrypting the operating system or the data disks then it can also give you context around the admin username so once the attacker has access to what the admin username is for the virtual machine that is one piece of the credential so you need a, a username and a password authentication so that's one part that you have access to and they can essentially like you know try to brute force get access to your virtual machine then another thing that's contained within the instance metadata is, is also the password authentication configuration and that gives context around if a password is required to log into the host and other things as well like the resource group name user data and you can sort of see where i'm going with this problem with this is the fact that if an attacker is able to steal this data right they're able to have context into your environment and if they have context, context gives them the understanding of your environment and the ability to then use that context to further exploit things in your environment. So that was the word that I was going to say, because what it looks like to me is you're kind of building
building up this it's almost like a recipe and like it's not necessarily about the individual piece of information mm-hmm. that you can steal but the sum of all of it and like oh, yeah. what can you get to with it yeah yes yes so essentially like what it, what are the valuable things in your environment that they can steal and then use to further exploit your, your environment right. so kind of covered like what there is to steal we, we understand now that uh, your Linux workload is a treasure trove but how do they actually steal it now this is typically a very simple process and we'll go over that in a second all right so this is a very simple uh you know excerpt of a python script that uh was uh, i got from an online blog basically this is not the entire script but as you can see here it's not, it might not be too clear but the first part of the script is essentially gathering all of this information so bash history z shell history git config known host ssh configuration aws credentials kubernetes credentials right and then it packages packages all that data up zips it into a zip file and then extracts the data to the attacker's infrastructure right the key thing we're focusing on here is the actual extraction piece but we've actually gone over those important things those treasurable things in, on your linux workload that they really want to steal which are all these things that are highlighted and once they have access to that they can then use some sort of extraction mechanism to steal it and we'll go over that in a second so basically you know the most common ones are typically through like you know file transfer protocols like ft even sftp or other you know file transfer protocols but there are two major culprits that i want to really highlight here because it's something that we use regularly but we don't really we might not really think into how much an attacker might use that to actually steal data from our environment so we've gone over you know what there is to steal we've gone over how they actually steal it at a high level which would we'll dive a bit deeper into in you know how to catch them but in this piece i'm going to show you like you know the two main culprits i talked about but but also a really quick intro into a methodology that uh, i use you know at work and is pretty much used in threat detection and detection engineering um, all over the world in order to streamline the process of actually catching these attackers. So this is going to be a very, very brief introduction to something called detection as code. And I think it is some short summary of it is essentially detection building books. But essentially in technical terms, it's a cybersecurity approach that you know uses code to automate detection of security threats, either by codifying the detections, but also applying like software development practices to build detections. And when you're actually you refer to the actual detection as code, there are three major building blocks. That's the query, the logic, and the enrichments. And you can see there's like layers to it, like an onion, right? Right. At the very, very smallest layer is the query, which is specifically looking for the parameters that define what the attacker is doing within the environment. Right? If we want to catch the attacker that's stealing data from our environment, what is at the bare minimum the specific activity we're looking for to catch this attacker? And then the next layer is the logic, and this defines the methodology. Basically, what rule or what threshold or, you know, just think of logic statements, like what statement are you going to use to tell the code to use that query to uh, identify the attacker's activities. And then enrichment is just like all the uh, extra stuff, like, you know, anything you can add to the detection to make it better at what it is. But the, the main things are your query and your logic. So going into the actual corporates I was talking about, the two major culprits I wanted to talk about was wget and curl. Now, if you're familiar with anything on, on you know, Linux, you probably use wget a lot. Probably like wget, like different things, right? Files or whatever the case is, download, whatever, or even like to test an endpoint to see if it's working or curl, right? Well, the thing about wget is it works both ways. The same way you can use it to download files, you can also use it to upload files. So the same way you can use it to make get requests, you can also use it to make post requests. I mean, in this case, uh, what wget is doing, what we're trying to find here is when an attacker is using a wget request to post a file so there's a particular parameter uh, for wget or you might call it a flag uh, when you're using bash it's called post file so essentially append a file to the post file flag and tell wget to post this file to an external entity like an ip address or a domain that might be ready to accept that file right that's the process the attacker would actually use for exfiltration but in this case we're using something called a sigma role i won't go too deep into that but it's essentially a, a method by which you can it's, it's essentially a, a language that allows you to do detection as code and what i'm pointing to here in, in this picture is the query we're looking for where the action is w get and then that flag is post file because that's what we know the attacker is going to do and then the second part of it is the logic right this is very very simple right the logic is essentially the selection piece of that just telling it this is what i want you to trigger now in a case where we might want it to like trigger maybe multiple things or you know uh different or like separate things we can use like and or or statements to define that but that's you know deviating a bit from what we're talking about but that's essentially what the logic is like what exactly is the query uh, that we're looking to use to detect uh, this particular activity and the enrichment is just everything else right telling you about what uh, the detection does right so description the title uh, different attack uh, tactics and techniques and just letting you know like who wrote the detection as well because this is like a open source repository of detection so it's just anything else 
that can tell you more information about this detection. So now that we've gone over like, you know, WGET as, at a high level, curl is also a, a huge cul culprit with this, right? So like I said, you know, typically think of curl as, you know, grab some, grab some data, grab something from a URL, test an endpoint, whatever the case is. But the same way you can get requests with all curl, you can also make post requests with curl. And there are very specific uh, parameters an attacker might use uh, that might indicate they're trying to exfiltrate data from a Linux workload. So like they can use like a parameter like flag K or like flag insecure to like, you know, allow the data to be transferred over an insecure or an unencrypted connection, basically trying to bypass whatever sort of like encryption mechanism you might have in your environment. It also use like a silent so that, you know, it does it in sort of a quiet mode. So like sometimes when you do curl and you know it's going to take a really long time, you don't want to see like, you know, all that processing, you just put it in silent mode. So like nobody, like you just, you know, put it somewhere in the background, uh, run it in the background. And then, you know, different other, other mechanisms like, you know, the form or upload file, just the same way you can use an upload file or a post file with whatever you get. But the main things I'm pointing out here is like the specific things that you actually use for your day-to-day -day activities on Linux could also be the same things that an attacker will use to steal this data. So I always remember like bi-directional capabilities of these different tools, WGET and curl. So we've gone over, you know, what is valuable on your Linux workloads. We've gone over why they want to steal it, how they will steal it, how to catch the thief, and then, you know, what tools they actually use to steal the data. All right, so bring it all together, right? Talk about why your Linux workloads are a treasure trove of data. There's a ton of things on there that I don't even realize that are extremely valuable to an attacker, right? And, you know, although, you know, the, the actual manipulation of like an environment or like exploitation comes from them using those things, you would probably want, you know, want to understand how they can actually steal that data before they can actually use it, which is why we're going over these exfiltration mechanisms. So there's a lot of things, you know, your batch history, I believe like the batch history stores up to your last 500 commands. And if you're like me or, or Gwen, probably just use the up button all the time. So <laughs> you're probably using the same commands over and over and over again. So it's like all these things are, are being logged somewhere, being stored somewhere, and like they're extremely valuable. And then, you know, the WGET and curl, those are the corporates I actually identified in this video, uh, in this presentation. However, there are other things like FTP, which is you know pretty common. If you block FTP, there's SFTP and various other ways that by which an attacker, you know, do like file transfer, you know, various other things. So like if you're working in like an on-prem environment, which is maybe unlikely, they could use like USB or right? they could mount like, you know, hard drives, but even, even in the cloud, you know, they could mount external, you know, uh, virtual, virtual disk and steal data. But like those are more, you know, complicated ways. I just wanted to cover the ones that are more uh, relatable to most people who use the next metadata data. And then finally, kind of went over a high level overview of like, you know, detection as code and how we can actually use codified detections to tell, define parameters by which we want to use to catch these attackers in their activities. Well, before we move, would detection as code be, because I know like sec you kind of divide security into like defensive and offensive and which, so this practice is for which side or is it like something used on both? It's, it, it, it leans more towards the defensive side. All right, so these are all the different sources of references I used. Um, I will have all of these things on, on GitHub a while after this presentation is uh, available. But yeah, that's really it. I hope this presentation was able to give you a high level and beginner overview of like what the exfiltration looks like. And I hope it was really relatable to, you know, what many developers or people use Linux for on a day-to-day -day basis and how attackers can actually use these things if they're able to steal that data from your Linux works. Thanks for listening. This, is, this was awesome. I learned a lot already. I'm going to go and clear my... <laughs> <laughs> My bash history. I really appreciate you hanging out. This was really, really, really interesting.